So I wanted to start with a little animation just to give you a picture of what it is that we're actually trying to do and what it is that we're doing. So I'm just going to let this one play. Okay. So what I just showed you here is the spread of H1N1 in 2009. So, you know, a big global pandemic of H1N1 flu, which took only about six weeks to spread as fast as a normal flu would actually take about six months or so. What I'm also showing you here is uh, flights. So I'm actually showing you the flights of, um, you know, just uh, flight routes coming out. So this shows you two things. It shows you the spread of the virus, but it also explains why you actually have the spread of the virus. So those are the kinds of qu questions that we are actually interested in. So, okay, there we go. So we're interested in describing how do these viruses spread, and I'm going to show you a little bit how we're actually doing this. But we're also interested in understanding why is it that these viruses spread. So again, I showed you this animation. It shows you the spread of the virus, but it also shows you that the flights are actually the ones transporting the viruses around. And then most importantly, I think, is that we're actually trying to use that information to do something about the spread of the viruses. So hopefully in future, we can use this information to spread future spread. We don't work on flu, though, at least not yet. So the four main viruses that we work on are these. So we worked a long time on Lassa, Ebola. Uh, we work on these in West Africa. So it's one of the other things that we do. We actually work with the viruses where they are. So we have the patients in West Africa, for example, primarily Sierra Leone, but also in Nigeria. We also work on Zika. We have done quite a lot of work with that. And then more recently, we have been starting working on West Nile, which is mostly focused here in the United States. So taking these, we're using this framework to essentially trying to understand the spread of these viruses, and we're using genomics to doing this. So we're going from virus genomes, so we have a patient that comes into a clinic somewhere who's infected, we take a blood sample from that, and we take that blood sample and we sequence the virus out of the blood of that individual. So via these genomes, we can essentially build family trees of exactly how is one virus that we sampled over here, how is that related to another virus sampled over here, and they leave a little blueprint of what that individual actually is. So we take these viral genomes, we, we call this genomic epidemiology, but importantly, it allows us to do precision epidemiology. We can really use the information to completely reconstruct exactly how are these viruses spreading across the world. And we're using this, we call it phylogenetics, and we'll show you some trees in a little bit, but think of these as essentially family histories. Again, the family histories are stamped into these viral genomes, and that's what we're actually using to reconstruct this spread. Importantly, you know, I'm talking about spread, but actually this can also be used for many other things like diagnosis, prevention, and treatment, and these are also things that we're involved in, but not, I'm not going to show that today. So taking that, just to talk about the spread part of this. See this. Okay. So how is why we can actually do it? So we can animate this over time. And I'm just showing you here how we have done this for these four viruses that I just mentioned. So we have Zika over here showing how we can do this for the uh, epidemic in the Americas. Ebola showing how this was actually happening in West Africa. Lhasa here in West Africa. And then the West Nile here in the United States. So again, the kind of information that goes into making these animations are just a virus genome, a time, and a place of where we have actually captured that viral genome. And again, we can completely reconstruct exactly how these viruses are spreading over these geographical areas through time. So if we zoom in on the Zika epidemic here, so this is one of the viruses that we have focused quite a lot on um, over the last couple of years. Well, we can show, again, exactly how did it actually spread you know, during this epidemic in the Americas. How did they get from Brazil, for example, from Brazil into the Caribbean, and then from the Caribbean across uh, the Americas in general? And one of the things, that, so when we do this, one of the things that we really notice that happens very frequently is that there's a huge gap between we actually realizing we have an outbreak of an infectious disease and when we can estimate that the outbreak actually started based on these genomes. So if you look down here, for example, this epidemic in the Americas started in Brazil. What we can show is that these are just the cases that we have here coming up. And we can show from the first case, which was detected in 2014, 
We actually show that the virus had been circulating and causing an outbreak in Brazil for almost a year and a half prior to us realizing that we had an outbreak going on. So more than a full year went on of this outbreak actually going on, and we just had no idea because we didn't really know to look for Zika. It was not something that we thought was very serious. And we also really didn't look to, to in the patients because, again, Zika is not something we have typically seen in Brazil. So again, for a full year and a half, we had this outbreak going on, which actually allowed the virus to spread very rapidly across the Americas. If we go into some of the other regions, for example, the Caribbean, the lag between the outbreak starting and us realizing it is about three months. Things like Central America, it's about six months or so. Now, one of the things that we were interested in was Florida, and Florida specifically has also a lag of about three months, the same that we actually saw here. But just having this lag, the other thing that we were interested in is saying, okay, we have this lag in Florida, but how many times did this virus actually get into Florida in the first place? Is this something that just happens once, and then you have an outbreak, or is this something that happens multiple times? And again, we can do this via these viral genomes, and what we can show is that this is actually something that happens over and over and over again. It's not that the virus comes into Florida causing an outbreak, it's that the virus is repeatedly coming into Florida and then causing an outbreak. So that leads to the next question, saying, okay, so if this is something that occurred, you know, earlier than we expected, it occurs many times, the question is, where is it actually coming from? And specifically here, we're talking about Florida. And what we can show is very clearly that the Caribbean is really where the virus was coming from. During the Zika outbreak, clearly the outbreak in Florida was caused by travelers, probably infected travelers coming over from the Caribbean. And again, we can do this based on our genomics. We can just ask ourselves in this family tree, where is the virus before we actually see it in Florida? And you can see here is a cluster that came from the Caribbean. Here's the Caribbean, and down here is also the Caribbean. So then we ask the next question, saying, OK, but does that make sense? So we start looking at travel patterns and saying, OK, where do infected individuals coming from? And indeed, we can show that actually the vast majority of people are coming from the Caribbean. And I think, interestingly, lost most of these actually came by cruises. So this allows us, again, to describe how Zika is spreading, to figuring out how is it coming into the country, where is it coming from, and what are actually the likely drivers of this. But we have since decided to switch to a different virus or include another virus into our portfolios is a very recent thing we started to do to actually start looking at West Nile virus. And West Nile virus is interesting because it's a single introduction into this country at the end of the 90s. Um, and it's the most important arbor virus that we have in this country. So it's caused thousands of cases and actually thousands of fatalities as well. Mosquitoes and birds, and as I mentioned, thousands of cases each year. But when we're looking at our understanding of the virus and the spread of the virus, we know quite a lot of the early beginnings. But for the past five to six years or so, we almost have no information whatsoever because we don't have any genomes at all. So this is something that we have set out to actually solve because we want to understand how is it spreading, how is it evolving, and then using that kind of information to start to, to do something about the spread. So the way that we have done this is that we have partnered with a huge number of public health labs, uh, 42 to be precise, uh, all across the United States here. We founded this, the West Nile 4K project, as we call it. As I mentioned, is that we are trying to understand the invasion. We are trying to get this high-definition uh, description of the viral spread itself. And again, we're doing this, this is a website based, right? But then there's open data visualization. So we're actually making all the data available. So we get samples from these public health labs, we're sequencing, and then we are making the data available that way. So just to summarize the way that we have set it up, I mentioned 30, oh, I guess somebody just signed up then. So, okay, so 32 states is now what we have. So 32 states is a pretty good coverage of all the states we have the, uh, West Nile in this country. 41 uh, institutions that are signed up with us here, mostly public health labs as well as vector control labs, but also academic labs, across 78 collaborators at this stage. So a huge project that we are trying to bring together. And of course, we are hoping to do this on West Nile, but of course, this can then build a model for other viruses that we might not yet know or might not yet be in this country. Right? Again, by partnering with the academics and the public health lab, we can make this, uh, this happen. 
So with that, I just wanted to thank my lab here at Scripps, as well as a huge number of collaborators that we have between the Center for Wild Systems Biology, Wildham Radnick Fever Consortium, and now also the West Nile 4K project. With that, thank you for listening.